Our gospel this morning is Luke chapter 3, beginning with verse 7. So John kept saying to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, You offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruits in keeping with repentance. Do not even think of saying to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. Because I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe is ready to strike the root of the trees. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. The crowds began to ask him, What should we do then? He answered them, Whoever has two shirts should share with the person who has none. And whoever has food should do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. They said, Teacher, what should we do? To them, he said, Collect no more than what you were authorized to. Soldiers were asking him, And what should we do? He told them, Do not extort money from anyone by force or false accusation. Be satisfied with your wages. The people were waiting expectantly. And we're all wondering in their hearts if John could be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water. But someone mightier than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. He will gather the wheat into his barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then with many other words he appealed to them and was preaching good news to the people. The Gospel of our Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, oh the joy of giving in its season. Doesn't it give you great joy to share with other people, to give with other people, especially this time of year? Many say that giving puts true meaning into our lives. Here are some famous people and their quotes. Albert Einstein said, only a life lived for others is a life worthwhile. Martin Luther King Jr. said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And the Russian author Leo Tolstoy wrote, the sole meaning of life is to serve humanity. These are all beautiful sayings. And you'd actually have to be pretty calloused to the heart if you wanted to disagree and do otherwise. God wants his people to give in good deeds. Absolutely. But if that were the whole message of Christianity, it would really be quite pharisaical. That's the same thing that the Pharisees were preaching. They were talking about fruits, and they commanded the people to do similar things as we heard from Albert Einstein, Martin Luther King Jr., and Leo Tolstoy. If that were all Christianity was, it wouldn't really solve all of life's biggest problems. So this Advent, let's aim higher. Let's take a closer look, more deeply, at what God has to say in his gospel to see where we might find heaven this Christmas. It's not exactly in our giving, but it is completely in Christ's coming. John the Baptist was a powerful preacher leading up to the ministry of Jesus Christ. He was the fulfillment of prophecies, in fact, that said what we sang in our hymn, to make the pathway straight, to level the mountains, to raise the valleys, because there needs to be a highway for the coming king. Later on in Matthew chapter 11, we get Jesus' opinion of John the Baptist. He says he's greater than all the other prophets. Just think about that, all of the Old Testament. He said John the Baptist is greater than them. In fact, Jesus' opinion of John the Baptist 
was there is no one born of a woman who is greater than John the Baptist. It's pretty great accolades from Jesus Christ. I would love for Jesus to say something like that about me. But he said it about John. Because John was there to prepare the hearts of the people. When they came out to listen to his preaching in this exotic wilderness with his strange clothing of camel's hair and his strange diet of locusts and honey, they were there to be baptized and their sins were forgiven. And of course they asked, what should they do? So John said something very similar to what we might have heard from the prophets to Share a tunic with someone who doesn't have one. I guess our translation says a shirt. Share your clothing, basically, and share your food because there are people in need. We might note at this point that when Jesus comes along, he's going to actually tell them to do something much bigger. He would tell a, a rich young ruler to sell everything, to sell all of his possessions. So we, we get an idea of the good deeds that the coming Messiah was going to proclaim. But that wasn't the only thing in John's message. And if we compare those works to fruits, John actually told them something very different than what the Pharisees were telling the people, was to have fruits of repentance. You can't really give enough and be pleasing to God. In fact, we find in the writer to the Hebrews, chapter 11, this whole hall of faith where God trains out these people and how they did good things out of faith. But towards the very beginning, Hebrews eleven six, 6, God says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So John wasn't there to preach fruits of appearance or just good deeds trying to stand on their own two legs. He was there to preach fruits that stem from a branch grafted into the true vine, real substance, a real God, fruits that come from repentance. Now we heard exactly what repentance was in the children's message. It has those two things. We often talk about confessing our sins and receiving absolution. The confessions of Lutheranism actually go into that a little bit deeper and say as we're confessing, we have two things going on within us. The first thing is that we are truly sorry for our sins. Do you see how that's very different from just doing good works? There are a lot of people out there who are chasing after their good, after their evil deeds, trying to compile all of these good works so that maybe they can tip the scales and maybe their balance of good deeds will outweigh the bad and the things that they have done against God. In fact, there are possibly even people who believe that true heaven is discovered here in this place on this earth when we do a good act of kindness, when we give. You know that feeling you get? And that is truly heaven to many people. But that's not really what the Bible teaches because you still have these old actions, these wrong deeds that stick to your clothing. You can't take it off with just giving good things out. If you give a tunic to someone else, you still are stuck in your sins without what comes first. A sorrow, a healthy sorrow over our sins. A knowledge that we need to be corrected. An understanding that we could never do enough. 500 years ago, Martin Luther wrote the Heidelberg Disputations, and one of the theses, one of the theses that he put in those, the Lesser known theses, not the 95 theses from the year before, but in the Heidelberg Disputation, he wrote, The law says, Do this, and it is never done. Can't do enough. You can't make up for all of your wrongdoings by your good deeds. How did, how did Martin Luther come up with that? Well, he was reading things like Romans 3 For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or earlier on, Romans 3, Now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. Apart from the law. To which the law and the prophets testify. This doesn't mean, this doesn't mean that we ought not to do good works. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 
and no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. And so John spared no words for those teachers, those Pharisees who were telling the people this. He called them an offspring of vipers, a brood of vipers. And when you hear that, it's hard not to think of the very first fruit that was taken from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the very first viper who spoke and spoke to the woman and told her that really it's not too bad and you will not surely die starting a whole train of sins that manifest themselves in our own lives. In the times then when we didn't give, when we had opportunities to bear good fruits and all of a sudden we realized we forgot, we realized we weren't up to the task, we realized we were self-involved, we really realized we really didn't want to hear what God had to say to us. And so God's law works on the hearts of people like you and me. But there's that other part of repentance that really helps us to characterize what's coming, what John the Baptist was preparing the way for. The other part of repentance is a faith, a confident assurance and trust that God has banished sins in the Son of God who came to die for us on a tree so that we could live again. And that kind of faith also marks our repentance. We're not stuck in the despair and loss of worrying and wondering, have we done enough? Can we give enough clothes? Can we offer enough food? Because we still have that stinging conscience. But faith renews us and reminds us there is one who has accomplished it all and who has conquered everything. So now what happens when we do good good deeds? Now, good deeds aren't repentance, but they're marked by the tree from which they came. That fruit, every fruit from a believer ought to come with a healthy sorrow over our sins, a contrition, as well as a faith that every time I do something good, it's really me just giving thanks to God. Every time I should give a tunic or food or a cup of water to one of the least of God's little ones, we're doing it for Christ. And all of a sudden, our fruits are no longer fruits of appearance, but each fruit is marked with repentance. It truly shapes what we have to give those around us in a way that's, that's kind of like this. I wonder if any of you have ever heard of Jerry Parr, a Secret Service agent for Ronald Reagan in 1981. In that same year, there was an assassination attempt made on the president's life by John Hinckley Jr. And Jerry Parr was the Secret Service agent behind President Reagan who shoved him into the limousine. And if he hadn't shoved Ronald Reagan into the limousine, they figure one of those six bullets that flew at him in 1.7 seconds would have struck Ronald Reagan and lodged in his head. Instead, the president was struck here. So Jerry Parr did a pretty great thing for the president of the United States. Now here's the remarkable part. The reason, I mean, if that wasn't remarkable enough, the reason Jerry Parr was in the Secret Service was because he had watched a Ronald Reagan movie when he was nine years old called Code of the Secret Service. If Ronald Reagan hadn't had his former life as a film actor, then perhaps in his life as a president, he wouldn't have been rescued early on in his first term. Isn't that remarkable? And I think the same thing could be said for us Christians. If we didn't have Jesus' former life of going to the cross and rising from the dead and giving us a new creation and new life, then the good deeds that we do now wouldn't count and wouldn't matter. There would be no Jerry Parr of our new lives. There wouldn't be any renewing or rescuing. When we pastors got together and talked about this text this past week, one of them said he knew a woman in his congregation whose son had died young. And so because of that, she decided she was going to give back into the community. Later on, she thought, you know, that really wasn't a good reason I was doing it because I wanted to give to those others who had lost. But later on, she discovered the reason that she gave 
was now in thanks to Christ Jesus for what he had done for her son who had died in the Lord and who continues to do. For those who might see our good deeds and praise our Father in heaven. And so we see that heaven is not found in our good deeds. Not exactly. Heaven is found completely in Christ's coming. And maybe it's a little bit of a challenge from what John the Baptist preaches here to figure out where in the world is heaven in this text. But it's there. Maybe uh, you saw that place where it talked about um, the one mightier than John was coming. See, we get John's opinion of Jesus. He says, I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. He will gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So we hear that people who don't do good good works out of repentance and faith, those people actually will be tossed into the fire. And that sounds very judgmental and awful, but that's hinging on the gospel of God. And what happens is what we might have missed out is the wheat, the, the substance, the fruits that came from repentance and faith, they actually turn out to be brought into this barn. That's right. Heaven is the garner or the barn where the mightier one was to come and bring in all of the good fruits, the good produce, and store it. In that comparison, you and I are the wheat. Those who have faith in the coming sun. And it's not too far off, I don't think, for us to think of another barn. Because if heaven is the one who is coming, how can we not think of his coming, his first coming in a stable, born in a feeding trough, a manger? No, that barn, that stable, was not heaven on earth. But beginning in that barn, God became man. Beginning in that barn, God became a man of sorrows who would suffer for sins and atone for them. Beginning in that barn, there was flesh and blood that we still feast on, pure gospel and holy communion. Beginning in that barn was the life of a baby who would be our Savior and who would be the one who would give us the faith that truly helps us and brings us into the barn of heaven, into that place. Martin Luther said the next thesis in his Heidelberg disputation is the gospel says, believe this, and it has already been done. And that's true for those of us who trust in the promise. After all, God loves you. God wanted you. God chose you. And he wanted to spend eternity with you. And for every sin of not giving and not repenting that you have committed God has Jesus' perfection beginning in that barn. He rejoices and sings over you, and he delights in you. Only a life lived for others did Jesus consider worthwhile. He considered the sole meaning of his life to serve humanity. He asked a persistent and urgent question, what am I going to do for these sinners? And he answered that question definitively. In that barn and the cross to come, and the first fruits of his life for all. Amen.